Testing one, two, one, two. Loud and clear. Hallelujah. That was uh, operator error. That was me. Amen. God is good. He's so good. And I want to welcome you to Wednesday in the Word as we continue our study of spiritual warfare. We spend the last, what, three weeks talking about the importance of uh, spiritual warfare, digging into it. And so tonight we're going to continue. Hallelujah. Before we even pray, I want to uh, give you some major announcements. Not major, but a few schedule changes. Sunday, August 6th, we're going to be bringing uh, the series on prayer and fasting and uh, spiritual warfare, all of it. We're going to uh, we're going to bring that to a, a single service. That Sunday, I want you to mark your calendars. I want you to be inviting people out uh, because this is real. Okay, I have been crying out to God for the longest while saying, God, I don't, I, you know, I just don't like church as usual anymore. We have got to be men and women that walk according to the word of God, walk in his authority, see the great works that he said we will do. And so I'm inviting you, I start networking, bringing people out, inviting them, because Sunday, August 6th, that Sunday service is not going to be kind of the schedule or the routine service. It's going to be different. We are expecting the presence of God here. Every time we meet, we expect the presence of God. But that particular service, I want to structure it where we really get out of the way and invite the presence of God here to move in a mighty way, to see lives transformed, to see miracles happen. Amen? And so mark your calendars. Start planning. It's a couple of weeks out, August 6th. That Sunday morning service will be a different structure as we invite the presence of God here as we wrap up this series of praying and fasting and spiritual warfare. And then we had for next month, we, as you know, we usually have the first Wednesday of every month as our night of worship. But uh, for August, we're going to push it to the second week which would be August 9th. So again, mark your calendars. We're going to just have night of worship for August 9th. Big service on August 6th, followed by night of worship, August 9th. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, I pray over the word, God, that you guide every word. I pray over every listener, God, that you touch their ears, their hearts, their minds. Prepare it to receive what you have in store tonight. And I pray against all the plans of the enemy to disrupt, to distract. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, we thank you that you have placed within us all authority over the enemy. And tonight we walk in that boldly. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now we're going to jump into the scriptures and the word of God. Amen. I, am, I, I told you I'm excited because even as we started this series on prayer and uh, on Sundays and then spiritual warfare during the week on Wednesday night, I have seen and experienced things happening, good things, but not just good things. I am also seeing the enemy really in disarray. And I told you last week that because we are focused on this, 
you may see some weird things happening in, in your personal lives around you. Don't be dismayed. Don't be surprised. Okay? I am revealing strategies of the enemy so that when it happens, you're not going to be caught off guard. You, would, you wouldn't be ignorant of the enemy's devices, but you're going to be confident in executing plans given to us directly from the throne room and from the Word of God, and you will be victorious. Hallelujah. You remember in Matthew chapter 22, Christ is talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the multitude, but uh, the Pharisees are the ones who are really challenging him. And they pose that question to him, trying to always trap him. So tell us, what's the great commandment? What's the great commandment? You know, they're trying to see if they can get him to say something. I mean, they were always looking to really have that, aha, uh -huh, got you. And so they say, what's the great commandment? So here is Jesus' response, okay, in verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Good. That sounds good, right? But he, was, he, he didn't end it there. He continued. <laughs> this is the first and great commandment. Amen? And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because on these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. In other words, these two are foundation for everything else. If you aren't loving God with all your heart and mind and, and, and spirit, if you aren't fully committed to God, you're already falling short. If you aren't loving your neighbors as, as yourself, you're already falling short. So to negate any of these two commandments is to start this journey deficient. And we know in the natural that if we don't have enough nutrients in our bodies, the term is we are malnourished. We are, we are malnourished because we don't have enough nutrients in our body. You know, I, I often say that everything we, you and I do in the natural has a spiritual equivalence to it, and this is no different. When we talk about nutrients, the thing to make you really start off on a well-balanced, well-spiritual-balanced diet, it is to love the Lord with a passion and enthusiasm. Remember, when I started sharing a couple of weeks ago on prayer on Sunday mornings, as well as when we started the spiritual warfare Bible study, both of those started off from a foundation of what? Intimacy with God, relationship with God. So you cannot replace those two commandments and say, okay, we're going to start over here. Let's start over there. Let's focus on some other area. Folks, you're already deficient in your spiritual walk. And it really concerns me when I see, especially a large component of the church, walk in in not the love of God. We've become more judgmental. We've point fingers more. We're chastising the world. We're chastising sinners. Let me say it again. We're chastising the world. We're chastising sinners. We're rebuking unbelievers. Maybe if I say it again, you'll understand the irony in that. You're chastising sinners, the unbelievers, and the world. Something is wrong with that picture. It would be the same as a sick person arriving at the hospital. They're all beat up. They're all wounded. They're all half dead. 
And you're like, what on earth are you doing here? Get out of here. Just, just go somewhere else. Uh, I'm coming to the place that can bring the healing that I need, administer the care that I need. But let me, you know, Sunday I, I said something that the enemy is so clever. And yeah, I said that. Satan isn't stupid. And too many Christians are being stupid about that fact. That the enemy is also clever in that he takes the very word of God that was given to us and uses it against us. Why? Because of our ignorance of the word of God. So whilst we were attacking the unbelievers, we were also keeping them out of heaven. We were also keeping them from a place of repentance. Instead of coming to them from the place of, listen, Christ is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Instead of quitting that job where you're surrounded by heathens, begin to pray that God give you strength and a word for each day so that you can begin to impact those people. You are the light in the darkness. And if the church runs to the mountaintop and, secude, and, sec, and secludes itself there, then how will the unbelievers see the light of God? So, coming right back to Matthew chapter 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind but don't stop there. You need to love your neighbors as yourself because all of these, all of these go before the laws of the prophets. They are foundation. And as we study spiritual warfare, this is really important matter. For us to understand who we are in Christ, to take on the fullness of God is to walk in that authority boldly. Because you begin to understand that in obedience to the word of God, you are breaking chains. You are setting captivity to many areas in your life free. So looking at first. Timothy in chapter 6. I don't know if I'll read all of that, but let's see. Beginning at verses 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil, useless wrangling of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. That's a lot of words right there. <laughs> That's a lot of words. taking the Word of God and kind of weaponizing it. We hear that word a lot lately in politics and social setting. But let's bring it back to the gospel. You know, how about those that are taking the gospel and, and just making a mockery out of it? And instead of it being the effective tool that was designed to be, we have now allowed the enemy to lie to us like he did to Adam and Eve. Lie to us to make us lose purpose, destiny, and vision. That's something else. I love the verse 6. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Instead of running after things, you know, we see preachers that are focused on the prosperity gospel because, you know, they pull a scripture verse out and they're focused on that. 
we see some focus on grace, and there it's heavy laden on grace. But what about the balanced diet? Because there is a wrath component to God. There is a consequence component to serving God. There is a right and a wrong. There is a sowing and a reaping. There, it's all of these things building on each other. And these things were not dismantled between the transition from the Old Testament to the New. They're still in place, but we're operating, yes, with a new level of grace. Yes, a new level of God's love and mercy to pour into our lives. But, you know, the irony there is that the expectation is higher and greater because the Scripture tells us that to whom much is given, much is required. And so, if anything, the fact that we are living in this day and age with all these resources, Bibles and its dozens of translation, commentaries by dozens of people, study notes by hundreds of people, I mean, internet, YouTube, I mean, we are inundated with information. So the reality is we have no excuse. When it comes to the things of God, we have got to be plugged in, plugged in, and staying plugged in. Else we're gonna we're gonna lose energy, we're gonna lose charge, you know, like your cell phone. How about we treat the word of God and treat our relationship with God the way we treat our cell phones? Yeah, I said that. I mean, I look at my kids. I mean, that phone has got to be charged. And you we travel, oh, charging. Charge cable. Anywhere you go, there's got to be a place to plug in. You, That phone cannot die. I've got to stay connected to my social media platforms and my emails and my texts. And How about we do the same for the things of God? How about we become inundated with his presence, with his word? How many times through the day does your mind just float over to the goodness of God, where you think about his goodness and his mercy, where a scripture verse just comes over you and brings you to a place of just brokenness as you realize his goodness. How many times in the day does that happen? We have got to begin to cultivate his presence. Cultivate his presence. It must be a lifestyle, and when we can have a lifestyle that is so bountiful with so many things, you know, my son plays football, and he isn't here, so he, he wouldn't hear this unless he's at home listening online. He plays football, and he, he, he's 13 years old, and he's very expressive. I mean, if he's, n if he's n happy about something, you know it. Okay. But I can tell you one thing. He is so excited about his football. Now they're practicing. You know, he's telling us, it's time to go, Dad. Time to go, Mom. He has calculated the time it takes, not just to leave the house, but to get there so he wouldn't be late. And I'm thinking, how come it is when we're getting ready for church, I've got to ask you an extra few minutes about getting ready? If you're putting this same dedication into your football, I'm sure you can do it. It just comes down to personal desire. And the, the same applies to the Word of God. What is it that you're passionate about? Does the Word of God excite your spirit? Just reflection in, of His goodness brings a peace to your mind? Folks, we're transitioning to a time when relying on the Word of God that's been deposited within us will be critical. 
He said, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, anchored, focused on me. And so tonight, we're in spiritual warfare, but I, I had to stress that. How do we recognize when we are being bombarded by spiritual influences? And let me say that we are. As long as you're living and walking in this life, you're subjected to spiritual forces. You are subjected to spiritual forces. And so you've got to really change your way of thinking, change your way of seeing, change your way of acting. The only way to do so is by allowing the mind of Christ to come over you. Remember, I said last week, put on the garment of praise. Put on the robe of righteousness. It begins to transform who you are. It changes the picture. It opens your eyes to see what you were once blind to see. It opens your ears to hear what you were once deaf to. But the Spirit of God quickens you and allows you to operate in a place that transcends the wisdom of this world. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, this is what it says, and it's a familiar passage of Scripture when we talk about spiritual warfare. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Amen? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We're not fighting our neighbors. We're not fighting our co-worker. You might have somebody that's acting really weird and strange. Listen, you're dealing with spiritual forces. I had an experience when I was yeah, living in another state. I'm not even going to tell you where that was. And ignorantly into ambushes and into defeat, trying to figure out one thing after the next, and we'll be confused and dazed when God says, listen, why don't you stop? Understand my word. Understand my promises. Know that I've deployed around and within you the strength to be overcomers. Remember, it was Daniel. Let's go back. Re Revelations chapter 12 is a reference to demonic forces falling. Revelations chapter 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Miguel and his angel, or Michael and his angels, fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought. And they did not prevail. Remember that. Did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels... Demonic forces, all right, were cast out with him. I want you to remember that. The great dragon was cast out, and he had a slew of demonic forces that accompanied him. We go to Daniel chapter 10. We see a story of the prophet Daniel praying and seeking God. He had a vision. It was disturbing in his spirit. And he is going before God. He is seeking God. It says he went in to prayer and fasting. But this is the part that's interesting. All right? 
verse 12. I want us to just start there. And angels appear to him. Then he said, do not fear, Daniel, for, for, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. You tell me prayer and its persistence doesn't matter. It matters. Let's go to verse 15. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. He lost strength. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lip. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. I am weak in my body. But listen to this, verse 17. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me, nor is any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. So you're going to experience weakness. But you have to understand there is warfare that is happening around you. It is happening around you. If you go back to verse 13, okay, the reason he couldn't get in, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which withstood me 21 days, this was the time he was fasting. We hear of the Daniel fast, 21 days. He was fasting. It says the prince of the kingdom of Persia, remember, Spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities, rulers, regional forces. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So this archangel who was warring against this demonic stronghold, the prince of Persia, had assistance from another mighty angel of God who came to his aid. And in that 21 days, a fight was happening. Listen, you need to understand it. I know this is crazy, but we are just operating in this world with a physical body. The actuality is we are spiritual beings. And the best thing that Satan has done with humanity is to minimize and, and in many cases totally remove the reality of our spiritual dimension. And so the majority of people simply see flesh, they see body. Don't talk to them about heaven and hell. What you see is what you get. Live, love, enjoy life. You die, you go away, you disappear. That's what the enemy wants you to think while he continued to capture as many as possible to take with him on that day when they will all be cast into the lake of fire. So how does demonic forces work? I want to list several familiar passages of Scripture, and I'll go through these really fast. So I, I really encourage you to take notes. These are all spiritual forces, Satan army deployed throughout the earth. And there's something else that I want you to know. When I really sat back and got a, a grasp of the gravity of this, man, it, it really awoke in my spirit. Because do you realize that these same demonic forces are the same ones that were attacking Daniel 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the same spirits that were attacking Saul, the same spirits that were attacking Elijah, those demonic forces have traveled through the ages. They are here today. What's the relevance of that information? It means they have an arsenal of humanity's behavior. You and I think we're clever. But demonic forces are showing up to work against you with decades, century of information of how humanity responds to things. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, all chronicled for decades and centuries, generations after generations, and now it's at your doorstep. They knew how your grandfather responded to this temptation. They're bringing it to you. They knew how your four parents reacted to this temptation. They're bringing it to you. They know how they reacted. They know how they resisted, and they're manipulating. So what does the believer do? The believer fortifies himself in the Word of God and allow the Spirit of God to fill him. So, one, spirit of the Antichrist. That's one. And all of them are really operating in that authority. And what is the spirit of the Antichrist? It is the spirit that rises up itself against what? The knowledge, even the knowledge of God. Remember, Satan was cast out of heaven. He still wishes he could be back there. And when he looks at humanity, who has an opportunity to unite with the Father, it brings him into rage. Because he sees an opportunity that was missed. So if you think you can play with fire and not get burned, it's a lie. Satan has no good things in store for you. So the spirit of the Antichrist is anything, anyone that is operating in a place that comes against the knowledge of God, comes against the Word of God. I don't care how nice they sound. I don't care how intellectual they may be. If what they're telling you comes against the Word of God, it is the spirit of the Antichrist that is at work. And you are to be aware of that. We see that in 1 John 4 and 3. Just take those notes. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and such is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. The second is familiar spirits, spirits that I shared with you that are tied to different things in our life. Familiar spirit. They're familiar with what has happened in your family for generations. Like I said, they know how your grandfather and your grandmother and your brother and your sister, they knew how they responded to these stimuli. They knew how they reacted. They knew what was the most effective way to entice them. And so instead of recreating the wheel, they simply package it better and better. So the believer must have himself equipped with the full armor of God. The full armor of God. The third is... The spirit of infirmity. The spirit of infirmity. 
We see in Luke chapter 13, Christ rebuked a woman who had a spirit of infirmity over her for 18 years, cast that devil out of her, a spirit that brought sickness over her. It says when she showed up there, she was bent over in a sick, sickly-looking state. But it wasn't physical. It was a spirit of infirmity that had infiltrated her, her body. And Jesus cast it out. Woman, you're loosed from your infirmity, he said. The other is a spirit of offense, something you've got to work against. Matthew chapter 24, just take note of that. Again, the spirit of the age is at work. The spirit of the Antichrist, all of that is at work. Offense. We'll see an increase of that, and we are seeing an increase of that in the in our world today. People are offended at the drop of a hat. They're offended at everything. You sneeze wrong, they're offended. Apologies don't mean anything anymore. It's crucify, crucify. The spirit of offense. That's spirits that's been deployed. And the purpose is to bring division. Because when we look at the the political landscape. Let's go back there. Let's, let's look at our political landscape. The eruption of offense for everything. This one said that. That one said this. This one didn't say it the right way. This one needs to apologize. This one needs to quit. This one needs to resign. Offense. Offense. Fight. 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 You think spiritual forces aren't sitting back going... Yeah, bring it. It requires men and women with a focus on righteousness, embodied with the Holy Spirit, to say, no, this is more than what we see. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Don't get caught up in that. Don't be a victim. Don't be a victim to the enemy's devices. When offense begins to rise up in you, you'll feel it. You'll feel that rising up in you. It's an anger. It's a frustration. It's an agitation. When that begins to happen, you need to rest it right there and says, you spirit that's trying to come in, I cast you off in the name of Jesus. Begin to speak to your environment. Begin to speak to yourself. The Word of God tells us to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Push it back. Says no. Spirit of fear. Second Timothy 1 and 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Those are tools. Those are weapons that God has given to us. To counter fear, anxiety, panic, worry. We read of the deaf and dumb spirit in Mark chapter 9. You can read that whole chapter and you can see the child that was brought to Christ who was afflicted by this mute spirit and how Christ spoke and delivered him. The spirit of whoredom, we read that in the Old Testament in Hosea chapter 5 and verse 4. I'm going through this fast because I'm looking at the time. So just take these notes. The spirit of whoredom was, a, was an indictment the people of Israel had gone to the place where they were following pagan gods. They were indulging in things that went against the scriptures, their commandment, their, ins their instructions. And the word was, listen, you have been committing harlotry. 
whoredom. It's a spirit that comes in to defile, to separate, to take you away from those things that are right. So when you see people begin to act in that way, contrary to the Word of God, going in a direction, embracing things that were normally something they should be abhorring, they should be turning from, and instead they're gravitating to it. They're now normalizing it. There's that word. We see that in society today. The perversion. The spirit of whoredom coming in. Foul spirit. Mark chapter 9 and again verse 25. The spirit of error which counters truth. The spirit of truth. That's 1 John 4 and 6. So lots of notes here. The spirit of divination. Python spirit. Acts chapter 16. Let's look at that one. And verse 16. Now as it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her master much profit by fortune telling. So this is prevalent in our society. People are operating and they, they call it, you know, we're, we're spiritually aware too. You know, we're, we're spiritually aware. Some of the well-meaning people that you meet, they look so normal, but they're operating under the spirit of divination. They're operating under the spirit of the Antichrist. Nothing that they're doing is aligned with the Holy Spirit's guidance. It is demonic forces that's leading them. Unclean spirit. We see Matthew 12 and 43 talks of that. Also in Luke chapter 4 and verse 33. The spirit of unclean. Demon. Those type of things you can see just based on what is happening in the person's lives. Spirit of slumber. Romans chapter 11 and verse 8. Also in Isaiah 29 and 10. We see that. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers, and overrunning and overflowing. They've been abandoned. They've been given over to. The spirit of heaviness in Isaiah 61 and 3, a very familiar passage, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And before that, the oil of joy for mourning. That they may be called trees of righteousness. Notice how all of this is being countered by the righteousness of Christ. And the tools that are being deployed against these demonic forces. The spirit of Jezebel. Revelations chapter 2 and verse 20. I want to read that. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. This was to the church of Thyatira. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. The spirit of Jezebel. Working through to deceive, to distract, to seduce men and women of God. And this spirit operates in not just in women, but also through men. You've got to be aware of these things. How do you counter an attack of these demonic forces? I can go into much more details in each of these categories that I listed. 
and break them down even more because under each of them there are, is, there are several things in life that we can tie to each of these demonic forces that are being deployed. But listen to the key. For the last several weeks I've been saying and sharing with you the passage of Scripture, 1 John chapter 2. Some of you are recognizing it right away. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. What does it say? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So how do we counter and prepare ourselves to fight against and successfully fight against all of these demonic forces that are going to come at us throughout the day, throughout our lives. It is by putting on the full armor of God, allowing our flesh not to be enticed and to be sucked in is where it starts. I don't have to give you a PhD in demonology You just need to start putting on the armor of God. And how do you put on the full armor of God? By spending time in the Word of God, by purifying yourself daily, by walking in His commandment. Listen to the armor of God, beginning at verse 14 of Galatians, of Ephesians chapter 6, sorry. It says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Above all, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God, praying, one of my favorite, always with praying and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We're going to stop there tonight because next week, I'm going to focus on building up your faith and overcoming the enemy. How do we do that? How do we walk in that? To counter demonic forces when we see it happen, the confidence that comes in being fully equipped with the power of God, the Holy Spirit in filling you, not to be fearful, not to be nervous, but to be confident that light dwells within you. And the light of the world overcomes the darkness. This was a lot. A lot of information that I shared with you tonight. So that you can be aware of what the enemy is doing. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Your word remains true. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit goes forth right now in Jesus' name. I pray over every ear that is here in this word tonight. I pray over them in Jesus' name. Spirit of God, quicken our hearts and our mind. Fill us, God. Fill us with more of you. Empty us of everything that tries to take away from the knowledge of God. Empty us, God so that we can be filled with you, Holy Spirit. Pray, God, that you strengthen us to see what we need to see. Open our ears to hear the truth. Touch our hands and our feet, God. Guide us in righteousness. 
Your word says that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And God, we pray, lead us, guide us, direct us in Jesus' name. May your angels continue to encamp around us. I pray over family members right now that are battling, that are battling sickness, that are battling diseases, that are battling anxiety and stress and worry. And I speak to those spirits that are tormenting their bodies right now, their mind, be broken in the name of Jesus. Set them free in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. I pray tonight that peace descend over your folks, that we walk in righteousness, that we experience a grace that transcends through the love of God. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, we praise you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope to see you on Sunday at 1015. Continue to walk in the power and the might of Jesus. God go with you. Amen. Hallelujah.